Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right. It's John's turn. What'd you pick? Uh, I picked a story by Shirley Jackson called The Lottery. Just as Mr. Summers finally left off talking and turned to the assembled villagers, Mrs. Hutchinson came hurriedly along the path to the square, her sweater thrown over her shoulders and slid into place in the back of the crowd. Clean forgot what day it was, she said to Mrs. Delacroix, who stood next to her, and they both laughed softly. Thought my old man was out back stacking wood, Mrs. Hutchinson went on. And then I looked out the window and the kids were gone. And then I remembered it was the 27th and came a-running. She dried her hands on her apron, and Mrs. Delacroix said, You're in time, though. They're still talking away up there. Mrs. Hutchinson craned her neck to see through the crowd and found her husband and children standing near the front. She tapped Mrs. Delacroix on the arm as a farewell and began to make her way through the crowd. The people separated good-humoredly to let her through. Two or three people said in voices just loud enough to be heard across the crowd, Here comes your Mrs. Hutchinson, and Bill, she made it after all. Mrs. Hutchinson reached her husband, and Mr. Summers, who had been waiting, said cheerfully, Thought we were going to have to get on without you, Tessie. Mrs. Hutchinson said, grinning, Wouldn't have me leave my dishes in the sink now, would you, Joe? And soft laughter ran through the crowd as the people stirred back into position after Mrs. Hutchinson's arrival. Well now, Mr. Summers said soberly, guess we better get started, get this over with, so as we can get back to work. Anybody ain't here? Dunbar, several people said. Dunbar, Dunbar. Mr. Summers consulted his list. Clyde Dunbar, he said. That's right. He's broke his leg, hasn't he? Who's drawing for him? Me, I guess, a woman said, and Mr. Summers turned to look at her. Wife draws for her husband, Mr. Summers said. Don't you have a grown boy to do it for you, Janie? Although Mr. Summers and everyone else in the village knew the answer perfectly well, it was the business of the official of the lottery to ask such questions formally. Mr. Summers waited with an expression of polite interest while Mrs. Dunbar answered. Horace is not but 16 yet, Mrs. Dunbar said regretfully. Guess I got a fill in for the old man this year. Right, Mr. Summers said. He made a note on the list he was holding. Then he asked, Watson boy drawing this year? A tall boy in the crowd raised his hand. Here, he said, I'm drawing for my mother and me. He blinked his eyes nervously and ducked his head as several voices in the crowd said things like, good fellow, Jack. I'm glad to see your mother's got a man to do it. Well, Mr. Summers said, guess that's everyone. Old man Warner, make it? Here, a voice said, and Mr. Summers nodded. A sudden hush fell on the crowd as Mr. Summers cleared his throat and looked at the list. All ready, he called. Now I'll read the names. Heads of families first, and the men come up and take a paper out of the box. Keep the paper folded in your hand without looking at it until everyone has had a turn. Everything clear? Dun, dun, dun. That's a good section to read because where you left off specifically because the story also ends on a note where you know what's about to happen, but she's not going to show you, right? Yeah. And here you're like left anticipating too. Yeah, I like that. So I have a guess why you picked it, but why don't you explain? Okay. It's like several things came to bear on this one. I have consult a couple of lists every once in a while, like the best short stories or short stories you just have to read. And um, this story consistently appears on those lists, like top 10 stories of all time or whatever. And then I saw the New Yorker tweeted a couple months ago or a while ago. They said, here's a story that when it was published, received the most mail we'd ever received for a story. And then they tweeted a link to it. And I was like, oh, I should read that at some point. I like pulled it up and saved it as a tab on my computer. And then all of a sudden, a podcast I was listening to was talking about Shirley Jackson. And then you guys were posting all this Shirley Jackson yeah. stuff in the group. And I was like, well, yeah. I got to bring this one in. <laughs> this is definitely yeah. like the uh, muses are speaking. I read something about how this was one of the stories the New Yorker got the most mail about. And what it talked about was how back in that day, which one was this published? Like 48? Yeah, 48. The New Yorker was apparently in a habit of not distinguishing between fact and fiction. And uh. so- a lot of readers called and they were like, what is this? <laughs> Which is the appropriate response, whether or not it's fiction. But um, yeah, some people thought this was actually going on. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. God. Shirley Jackson has gotten like a resurgence lately because we're finally realizing, you know, Stephen King's not the only one. And they're like making her stuff into films and films about her and anniversaries are coming up. I think they like publish something like after her death, like an older manuscript or something. I don't know. But uh, to your point, this is one of those stories that I think either we've heard about or we've had to read. And I've definitely read it, but it's been forever. I somehow managed to never read it before. I don't know. 
Oh, really? I missed okay. it. Yeah, I don't know. It's just like one of those ones, like you said, that's on every list. Especially when you Google things like I do, which is free short stories online. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so what'd you like about it? Oh, I mean, there's the obvious, the way it ends, just to build up the horror of it all. It's great. But one of the things I really loved about this story was just the ordinary mundane community, the way the community and the, the relationships and they're talking to each other and was portrayed. It was so compelling, so good, um, interesting. I just like the way they talk to each other. Yeah, because none of them is really uh, letting on as to how serious this is. Yeah, it's like just nice, good small town chat. You know? Yeah, which is probably why people thought, oh my god, this is real, but also why like it passes the test of, you know, being good fiction, because it's believable up until the point when it's horrific. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like what's her name who wrote Hunger Games like just totally lifted this entire concept, especially of like the lottery being uh... something the whole community watches and with this kind of I don't know, resignation almost. Like they know that this isn't ideal, but they've all somehow agreed that it should happen for whatever reason because it's always happened that way. Or like I'm still trying to figure this out. Like if it happens to one person, then it doesn't happen to everyone. It's like movies like The Purge where one night a year you get to beat the living shit out of your neighbor and, (laughs) you know, commit horrific crime with the idea that, you know, you get it out of your system. And then uh, the rest of the time you're sick. And then, like, Hunger Games, I kind of forget the premise, but it's the same thing where, like, every year you have these volunteers from these places and then they compete. I think it's for food. I think, like, the winner gets the most food, which is, like, you know, not a fair way to decide who gets food, but that's why everyone's game to do it. Yeah, I guess it's in the title of the novel, Christine. And then it also reminds me of uh, this horror movie I saw recently called Midsummer. Midsummer, but it's not S U M M E R. It's S O M M A R. I won't ruin it, but it's about these college Americans that go visit their friend somewhere in like Scandinavia, and he like convinces them all to come with him. And it turns out he's part of this horrific cult that sacrifices some of its own every year, and it's like part of this ritual. And it's a horror movie, so I don't know. All of these things are like swirling in my mind and I'm like it was Shirley Jackson she informed (laughs) all of you yeah I think that's why reading this in 2021 you kind of have a better anticipation of what it is we're kind of leading up to it's almost like a familiar concept it's also like in the Bible, right? Stoning women. But <laughs> That's um, right. you don't really like pick them from the crowd. It's more like witch burning. Yeah. I mean, the first time I read it, I didn't know what was going to happen. I couldn't, I knew something, you know, it's a lottery. They're choosing for something, but I, I didn't have any guesses. And, and that might be just the way I read. I don't always guess. I don't always let myself sure. guess like that. I just, I'm along for the ride. But, you know, rereading it, I was like, well, the stones are there in the beginning. They make the piles. It's kind of, you could put it together pretty yes. easily there is a uh, one line or old man warner said uh used to be a saying about lottery in june corn be heavy soon it's almost like it's like a sacrifice you know like they used to um right way back in the old thousands of years ago they'd kill children they'd kill animals in order to reap the benefits of things you know right so i can see this as being like a uh like a harvest ritual you know that's just right. kind of hung on for all these centuries with that theory though there's never any confirmation that this is a sacrifice toward a god or for a direct purpose you know what i mean like you kind of read this and you're left wondering why well that's i think that's what makes it more terrifying is that yeah that it has if it was originally you know and i'm guessing at whatever the uh, sociological history of this is but in this alternate world where these stonings are still going on or these <laughs> this lottery is going on if it was originally some sort of thing like a, a guarantee for a good harvest, then that has been forgotten, right? These people right. are doing this just because this is what you do. It's not for any reason then we do right. this every year. We just have to. Yeah, there's tons of hints about that, right? Like how, uh, you know, they, they're familiar with it, but sometimes forget the rules year to year. Like Mrs. Yeah. Hutchinson, who draws the dot and gets stoned, like kind of forgot about it. And like in the section that you That's read, right. she's in the middle of housework when she realizes it's her time to die. And yeah, nobody's really questioning 
questioning whether or not it should happen until she's like literally being stoned to death and saying, it's not right. Yeah, it's not fair. She's crying. It's not fair. Yeah, which it doesn't sound like anybody else who doesn't have their life flashing before their eyes is really concerned with until, you know, it's like something that they do blindly, but also that they should all realize would benefit them if they called it out. Yeah, I love the little detail where someone gave little Davy Hutchinson a few pebbles. It's like, okay, yeah, go stone, stone his your own mom. mother. Yeah, fucked up. Yeah, and there's tons of examples of the youth throughout where, you know, okay, if your daughter's married off, she draws in that family or the husband does or whatever. If your son is of a certain age, he draws or you can kind of like, it sounds like spare him in certain situations. So there's like people trying to spare their family members by like volunteering to draw for them. And they all know that the outcome is horrific, but they're all willing to let it happen to someone else, just not anyone in their like immediate family. Like they're more willing even to let it happen to themselves than, than their immediate family. It's, I don't know. It's bizarre. Mm -hmm. I had to read like criticism about this to know what critics thought the actual takeaway was because like I would have to think about it really long and hard to come up with something profound. So I just, you know, did the Sparknotes version. But yeah, yeah, like the closest I got was basically like, you know, if a Fox News commentator got a hold of this now, they'd probably say it was an example of like cancel culture. But really, it's like... Yeah, really the term is scapegoating. And yeah. that was an interesting theme because scapegoating is different than a sacrifice because it's like deflecting whatever problems you've been, you know, privy to or part of on someone else, blaming everything on one person when it can't possibly be their fault. Immigrants. <laughs> yeah, like and whoever it is, you know, they do it once a year and they feel absolved somehow. And now that you mentioned the bit about the crops, it's like that makes sense too so i like who knows shirley jackson didn't tell us for a reason and like you said it makes it scarier but i imagine this read so much differently in 1948 than it would like today oh yeah yeah i think you know the scapegoating thing's interesting uh i just don't see they're not like blaming her it's like okay you drew the dot now everything is your fault therefore we're gonna stone you it's just like you drew the dot you get stoned that's it it's just random I just see it as more of a, uh, like a ritual that no one remembers the beginning of just like a, it's kind of just like blindly following along, you know, not questioning the things that our society does, you know, you you have to go along, you have to do your duty. (laughs) Right. Which could get you stoned. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Keep your head down until it's your turn. But it's also like, uh, like I think some of what I was reading about the uh, concept of scapegoating could also mean like, not that that's actually what's taking place in the fictional story, but the theme that like Shirley Jackson wants us to take away to apply to actual life, you know? Like they might not oh. be scapegoating her in the story, but it might be like an illustration of what that looks like. I don't know if that distinction is clear. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Yeah. yeah, it's also like, you know, we saw a lot of this during the pandemic where people were comparing everything to like Nazi Germany and they were saying things you know you see those like memes that would like it's the same language it's like I didn't say anything when they came for the Jews I didn't say anything when they came for the blah 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 you know and then there was no one left to say anything when they came for me horrific comparison however I could see that being compared here like you said to just kind of like blindly follow what people are telling you to do even though you kind of know deep down that it's bullshit and uh if you don't step up for it like nobody's gonna like mrs hutchinson it sounds like knows it's not fair but she didn't say anything and now now it's her turn she was going along with it yeah until she got the dot and it was all of a sudden like wait a minute wait yeah (laughs) yeah and at that point it's too late at that point it's too late and it's a terrible comparison but like it sounds to me since we don't have a firm grasp of why they're doing this that a lot of people would probably have been open to the idea of no longer doing it had someone mentioned that idea Yeah, but back to what I said at the beginning, how this just kind of leaves off. We don't actually see her get stoned to death. There's just the one line that kind of tells you what's what's about to happen. And it says, a stone hit her on the side of her head. Yeah. Yeah. And there's two more very short sentences after that. And like you said, you you read it twice. I remember as I started reading this, it started coming to me what it was. So the bit about the rocks at the very beginning reminded me. But to your point, if you kind of come back through, there's hints at what this is that you can't know when you first read it. But I saw something recently about like foreshadowing. I'm not going to be able to remember what it was, but I remember like really, really oversimplified what good foreshadowing is. And I don't know if it was in reference to a movie or something and it was kind of cheap that way, but it was basically saying like, oh, you should definitely foreshadow as a way to basically give away the ending. And I don't think that's what foreshadowing is. I think foreshadowing can be 
these hints at something ominous, right? And this like building tension that's like foreshadowing something terrible. Um, it doesn't have to be that at the very beginning, little Billy grabs a rock and says, I can't wait to stone someone, right? <laughs> It yeah. doesn't have to be <laughs> so obvious. I think foreshadowing happens all the time, but unless it is obvious, we don't necessarily know that's what it was. We talk about it differently in hindsight. We're like, oh, well, there were clues. It's like, yeah, <laughs> I think that's what foreshadowing is. And like, you know, you could feel something mounting. It's like, yeah, that's like rising tension, which could be foreshadowing something horrific. You don't know what it is. You just know something is coming. And I think that's a tool that we kind of forget about. We don't have to tell people what's about to happen. Happen, we can tell them something is about to happen, though. And that can feel like a reason to turn the page. We can keep people guessing. Yeah, I think there might be different kinds of foreshadowing, but maybe the kind that we're kind of seeing here is more of a um, setting up a mood. So it's just a gradual unfurling of what, like you said, tension, right? So the mood at the end is going to be this terrifying moment of, holy crap, what is happening? This is happening. So it's ramping up that tension that builds to that moment. And that kind of falls into what uh, a certain kind of foreshadowing is. That makes sense. It's not giving us information. It's giving us emotion. Valence. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Like information versus like an emotional expectation or something. Yeah, that's basically what I was hinting at is that, like I said, you don't have to tell us exactly what's going to happen for us to feel that something is coming. And you might have to do that in a subtle way. But like here, like you said, you know, off the bat, what you liked about this story was kind of the interactions of these towns people. And there's a lot of names thrown at you really quickly, but very quickly, you also get a sense of the, of the dynamic of the town. Yes. So even though we don't know these people, we know these types of people. And when they're handling like the black box and there's these like pregnant pauses and they gather people around and there's silence, all of those things that we're paying attention to as kind of plot in the moment is also adding to this rising tension. Like it's interesting in the moment, even though we don't know who these people are or why they're doing this, we're still along for the ride. And then at the same time, like this unknowing is what's propelling you to read and foreshadow the end. It's different too than people who write stories and you don't get the point until the end because you're like completely lost, right? We're not lost in this story. We get the concept of what a lottery is. We get the concept of basically what a town meeting is. All those things are clear. It's There's not a whole lot going on. We're very clear about what is happening. Like she's really detailed about the box, about the gathering yep. townsfolk, the fact that they're drawing basically lots, who gets to draw, what the family dynamics are everything is like very clear about what's happening but right we're not necessarily privy to why it's happening and even the town's not entirely tr- sure of why it's happening or to what purpose it's all happening like what is the ultimate like what happens to that person who quote unquote wins right yeah so that's an interesting thing to do in a story where you're perfectly clear about everything that's going on without explaining it now i'm gonna rack my brain for another example of this oh, i'm sure it happens all the time <laughs> yeah but i don't think it's as easy to do as as you think no no, it's not. To make that compelling, because I think we as uh, as human beings, we're kind of purpose-seeking, right? We always want to know right, why really something cool. is happening. Why? What are the goals here? What is what is motivating people? That could be my takeaway. I didn't really have one before this, but uh, <laughs> this concept of a familiar premise that you kind of turn on its head with something really scary. It could be like, you know, kids lining up for recess, but they're getting marched off to like some kid brawl. It doesn't all have to be like death or like destruction either. It could just be like subversive somehow. That story, uh, Celeste Ng, Girls at Play comes to mind. In the episode, we kind of talked about how she should have taken that idea farther. Yeah, yeah. Kind of retreated from this really cool idea into a familiar trope. Right. Whereas it could have been explored in a different way. But that kind of... The way that was set up was similar to this where it was just like factual right this is what happens they take the bands the colors mean certain things yeah i'm gonna be thinking about that for a while because a lot of times we think 
a scary story has to be something that we're familiar with almost, like a murder or a ghost or, I don't know, just someone with bad intentions doing something bad. But this is a scary story, and it's scary because a lottery sounds like a good thing. That's right. And somebody's going to hit the jackpot, and then at the end, it's like, oh my god, no. This was terrible, I and I'm not familiar with people stoning people in modern day. Yeah, there's like that twist that makes it horrific versus just scary. It's not like a jump scare story. It's like horror. It's good. What was that other story? Was that the Stephen King one? Herman Woke is de- is still alive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where she won the lottery and that was not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, no, something bad happened to her too. This is why I don't play the lottery. Yeah, so what else do you like about this one? I like this moment when uh, people began to look around to see the Hutchinsons. This is after um, everyone realized that Bill Hutchinson's got it. He's got the mark. People began to look around to see the Hutchinsons. Bill Hutchinson was standing quiet, staring down at the paper in his hand. Suddenly, Tessie Hutchinson shouted to Mr. Summers, You didn't give him time enough to take any paper he wanted. I saw you. It wasn't fair. Be a good sport, Tessie, Mrs. Delacroix called, and Mrs. Graves said, all of us took the same chance. Shut up, Tessie, Bill Hutchinson said. <laughs> I don't know why. That's like one of those really believable dynamics. You feel, you get a sense of all the characters. And it's like when they say that use the details to sell the fictive dream to make people just dis- like suspend their disbelief. That's the kind of detail that helps you suspend your disbelief because you believe it. Right. And that part's just like kind of sickening, right? Because she's like defending her husband, right? (laughs) He's like, shut up. You look like an idiot. Yeah, you're right. It is believable. So this is also a good example of why people like Shirley Jackson, and she does, I think, now get her dues, but sometimes I'll shit on Stephen King (laughs) because I feel like a lot of times his work is just a good idea and it's not always like beautifully executed or anything. He's just like really imaginative and he's a fucking workhorse. So he'll come up with a great idea and actually see it through. I come up with great ideas like every five minutes and I've probably seen like one through ever. So (laughs) that's the difference. But this is a good example like you said that dynamic between the husband and wife and that dialogue it feels really really real and so people like Shirley Jackson are only able to pull off stories like this that you know get ranked on top 10 lists even though they're considered like this pop culture genre of horror because they are terrific writers and they're able to capture this true human sentiment in everything they're doing whether or not it's realistic it just doesn't work unless you can write a believable character yeah and she's done something really this is kind of the way that like that Faulkner story rose for Emily where she's made the whole town a believable character right all of these interactions amongst all these people they're like town folk and you believe in this town you believe in this world because of it right that could be your takeaway that is my takeaway (laughs) is it like the town as characters yeah because we yeah I feel like we've definitely covered that before like the town as a character is almost as simple a trope as something like telling your reader it's world war ii off the bat you know or i have other examples and now i can't remember them but there are certain examples of like settings and time and place or even like conflicts where you're immediately like thrust into a frame of mind and the writer has to do less heavy lifting because of how common that is and how familiar we are with it and it's just like towns as characters where you say something like it was a small town and you introduce like two characters with names names who are like ornery and like we fill in the blanks we know yeah. exactly <laughs> it's like it's like doing a movie and you're like it's a western by the way and you're like got <laughs> it i see yep. dust i see horses lots of saloons everyone's drunk that's right yeah there's a criminal coming these parts of town like you're anticipating all these familiar things that we've seen a million times but you still have to pull it off if you're going to keep it up so she's doing that right she tells you this is a town and we accept that we operate off that but then she still has to bring it to life so that it's a specific town and i think she does that oh she does that amazingly i think she does it better than like the rose for emily thing that's like the collective we and we talked about that with that and girls right. at play whereas this is these are individual characters right, and some, right, of, right. some of them are kind of cookie cutter but you get mrs hutchinson obviously is a really important one the old man uh warner was his name something like that there's a couple of people that stand out and they get to represent and kind of 
flesh out this little town so that we know who these people are and who this town is because of their interactions. It's not just the we voice that we get from some other stories. I think that's how she does it here. I don't think there's a, this isn't like a better way or a worse way using one or the other, but this is just a different way to do it. And it's done spectacularly well. I think that's my main takeaway is just the the town dynamic, portraying the dynamic between the town people. You know, what's happening is obviously a driver of the story, but their dynamic helps drive it too. Right, right, right. I had to read criticism for this too, but it talked about how the last names of these first two characters are Mr. Graves and I think Mr. Summers. Yeah. And they were like, ooh, a summer grave. <laughs> Every <laughs> summer we kill someone. And I was like, yeah, that probably was intentional. Uh, also, yeah. I hate it. <laughs> I mean, that's just cutesy. I don't know. That's pointless. Yeah, it's just cutesy. I hope nobody like <laughs> read this and was like, uh, aha. Then like, oh, Hutchinson. That means uh, oh, Hutch. something too, right? <laughs> he loves his Hutch. <laughs> okay, so that is your takeaway then? Yeah, just that community dynamic. Yeah, and how to kind of like insert it. Well, like I said, I'm just going to go back to what I came up with on the fly there, which is not, I still don't have a better example of it, but... I remember the first couple scary stories I read in fiction, some of them I came across while looking for something for this podcast or even like our Facebook group, you know, like around like Halloween or something. I was always surprised that there could be like kind of scary tense moments on the page because I'm so used to jump scares in theaters or like uh, just like nasty, grotesque visuals or, you know, anything that like applies to all five senses when it's scary. And, um... I think the subtle difference is like horror, which is like, in this case, it almost like indicates that you have to be surprised by something to be horrified by it. You have to be like truly taken aback by what you've arrived at. Not just like, we're all afraid of ghosts. It's not like we have to realize what they are to be horrified by them. We're afraid of them. We're scared of them. We know what they are. But this is horrifying because you think it's a townspeople... (laughs) playing the lotto and then you're horrified to learn that it's this like terrible ritual and that is horror that's great on the page it works in some films but we tend to call those like thrillers almost when you're a teenager and you're gonna go see a scary movie you're talking about ghosts aliens thrashers right your parents are the ones that want to see something a little more like building so back to my core takeaway if you can do something where we think we understand the rules but we're not totally sure so we're reading to see what it is we're missing you know if you can build that kind of suspense and anticipation and essentially foreshadowing of something then you have an opportunity as a writer to really surprise us and it can be a shocking scary gross surprise that makes it horror yeah it's almost like uh what was the one i think you picked it where the girl's at home and the two guys come and knock oh where are you going where have you been joyce carol oates yeah so well and we know that joyce carol oates does that kind of stuff sometimes too but like that felt like horror right yeah and it was it was more like along the lines of like a scary movie because like i said the evil is almost known that little girl was trying to wrap her mind around it the whole time but we as adult readers know that two grown men are dangerous around a teenage girl that dynamic is familiar so we were reading it almost like a scary story throughout but nothing bad ever happened it was just about to happen and that's like really good horror on the page yeah that story was basically about her coming to terms with this bad thing is going to happen and there's yeah. nothing she can do about it God, that's which is terrible. which is terrifying that is horrifying oh, yeah. that is like oh yeah <laughs> yeah It's kind of like Mrs. Hutchinson at the end here, right? She's like, there's nothing she can do about it. I used to, when people ask me what kind of fiction I used to like, I was the asshole that would say like literary fiction. (laughs) And it was true because I wasn't necessarily reading stuff like Twilight. Like I, I read all that, but that wasn't what I read when I thought about good writing. You know what I mean? It was what I read for fun. And, uh, now having done this podcast as long as we have, and also like the workshop where we're sharing stuff on Facebook, like I've really come to love sci-fi oh yeah and stuff like this like horror that i never would have categorized myself as liking because i always associated it with like cheaper forms 
of fiction. But uh, like I said, Shirley Jackson's pulling something really deft off here and she doesn't always get like the cheap horror the way Stephen King churns them out. Like there's real talent here and it's really, really, really fun to read, which is not a bad thing. Reading this story makes me want to read her book that... Uh, oh, yeah. The Haunting of Hill House or something like Yeah. That? I saw the Netflix show and uh, I get why the Netflix show is better than horror movies and scary movies, you know, because there's more storytelling to it on the page. I imagine that just means it's really good fiction. You know what I mean? It's novel when a scary story has a story behind it, <laughs> not just a series of jump scares. Usually it's like oh, a family yeah. moves into a haunted house and the house is haunted and it's scary. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's haunted from day one and things are going to jump out at you. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, like it's hard for me to like distinguish between scary movies I've seen because they're all the exact same premise. It's like what makes them unique, what made Haunting of Hill House unique was that there was more than just a haunted house. Like there are characters with backstories and um like actual mental demons. So yeah, I would be curious to read the book now having seen that and like differentiated it for myself. Very good. Thanks guys. A long time ago, I watched a Harrison Ford movie, um, What Lies Beneath, because it was Harrison Ford. Yeah, and you think he's hot? Oh, yeah. I was like, oh, I got to watch yeah. this. Oh, yeah. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter at our website, NaplesWritersWorkshop.com. And for daily writing tips, industry news, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at Facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop.